I'd like to welcome you to the third Thursday program for October. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to say a few words about Archives Month, which is celebrated each October. Since 2006, the American Archives Month serves as an opportunity for those of us in this profession to remind people of the value of archival records and the role we archivists have in preserving and making records accessible to citizens, researchers, students, and others. Governor Lamont has generously issued a proclamation proclaiming October as Connecticut Archives Month, and a copy is on display up here in the front. Open accessible archival records provide transparency into the development and implementation of public policy and the evolution of human rights, property rights, legislation, and constitutional law. Connecticut Ar Connecticut's archival records, which date from its earliest pre-colonial settlements to the present, record the rich and diverse history of Connecticut, its contribution to the legal, political, and economic development of the nation, and the accomplishments of its citizens. The Connecticut State Archives today houses more than 48,000 feet of records that document the functions of state and local government, as well as private institutions and organizations and the lives of individuals, both great and small. Today's topic focuses on the lives of individuals in the form of family records and images, in addition to documenting the genealogical history of individuals and families. These records are a rich source of social history. Preserving them is essential to sustaining a sense of self and community, whether personal or social. Our speaker today is Donya Khan, and she is an assistant professor of practice for the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science, as well as an independent preservation and collection care consultant for small and mid-sized cultural heritage um, institutions with over 20 years of experience. I've worked with her on a number of educational programs sponsored by the Connecticut State Historical Records Advisory Board and Conservation Connection for these types of institutions here in Connecticut, as well as for the town clerks through the Historic Documents Preservation Program. She is also a private book and paper conservator and a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation, AIC. Danya earned her BA in mathematics, so how she ended up in the archives, <laughs> um, from St. Um, Olaf College in Minnesota, which is my home state, and her MLIS with advanced certificate in conservation from the University of Texas in Austin. Previously, Danya has worked for the Northeast Document Conservation Center, Northwestern University, and Syracuse University. We are honored to have her as our third Thursday speaker for Archives Month. Please welcome Danya. Thank you, everybody. Um, I usually don't do just these short 45 minute sorts of talks because I really have a lot of trouble keeping myself to 45 minutes when I start talking about this topic because I really have a lot of fun. But um, I'm going to try to keep myself on time and leave us with you know, time for questions. So all of us have, hopefully, um, collections that have come down to us through the years from our family. I mean, we all have inherited genealogical things. It one turns out that if you go and you become a librarian or an archivist, all of a sudden your family decides, oh, she'll get all of the stuff. <laughs> so pretty much everything down both sides of the family has been coming to me. So I've got family lines um, and family things coming out of my ears, but we all know that they're just wonderful things. You know, we all have photographs, and then sometimes we get lucky to get letters um, from family members, diaries, documents, just a wealth of things. Some of us get scrapbooks, which we wonder why we have and what we're going to do with it. We'll talk about that a little bit. Sometimes we can get objects. So if you um, search in the Connecticut State Library's collections um, of the World War I items, you will find a cat and nine tails that my grandfather stole from a monk when he was a medic in World War I. Um, and um, many of us will have home movies. For almost all of these objects, we can have them in either physical or digital form. And so we're going to talk about both of those today, but I'm going to 
try to um, get you thinking about your digital objects because as we will find out, it is really easy to save something that has been in the shaving mirror pocket of a soldier in World War I, and this survived. It's, okay, maybe not pristine, it's been a little munched, it probably um, got wet at some point, in fact, I know it probably got wet at some point, but we still have it. If we look at this and we think about some of the damage that's occurred to this, and we translate into our digital files, it pretty much means we're not opening them, they're gone. So we want to, um, we'll talk today about how we can care for our physical collections, but also how we can care for and create our new digital collections. So first of all, I want to talk about storage. And yes, I, I teach a lot for um, professional institutions. I teach you know, upcoming professionals at Simmons University. But I also talk to a lot of home collectors. And if I ever step in front of them, they just let me know. Um, and what I like to tell the home collector is, yes, if you read the literature, it tells you you must be storing things at this temperature, and it must be at this relative humidity. For those of us at home, I know I can't maintain those sorts of levels all the time. I don't think most people can, but what we can do is think about where we're storing our collections. Are we storing them in just any old box that we found and everything's just kind of chucked in there and then we stick it on a shelf in the basement because we can't find any other space for it, or even worse, oh, we'll stick it up in the attic. The attic's a good spot for it because you know, we really don't need to get at it much. And if half of your stuff is anything like mine, it came out of the attic from your grandparents' home when they moved into, you know, smaller facilities, or even worse, came out of the disused outhouse <clears throat> at your grandmother's that had a hole in the roof when your grandmother figured out, oh, she can take it all. <laughs> um, so we want to think in, of our collections in terms of ourselves. Our collections, um, whether they're physical or digital, are going to be most comfortable where we're comfortable. So they would be perfectly happy to be in a box up on that, you know, top shelf in your back closet, you know, in that back corner where you really don't need to get at it all the time, but you know it's there and you know it's safe. Basements, of course, as well, this morning, at least I was lucky my basement was dry, but I'm sure there are a lot of people right now that um, don't have dry basements. They tend to flood when we get, what did you say was that? Somewhere around here got six plus? Six plus inches, yes. Six plus inches of rain overnight. We only had two and a half. Which is still a lot, but, you know, old basements can't handle that. But basements in general are also damp. They get really buggy. So we want to try to avoid that. Attics on the, you know, flip side tend to be more dry, but then has anybody gone up in their attic on a July afternoon? I try to avoid it because it's just too stinking hot up there. And plus, I have squirrels. So, okay, basements, cool, damp, lots of insects, attics, hot and squirrely. And I, I, I have three kinds of squirrels in my attic. I'm, I'm an equal opportunity attic. I've got flying, I've got gray, and I've got red. We want to think about storing things on shelves on quality shelves, you know, so we're not going back to our college days where we're just taking raw lumber and putting a couple of cement blocks and you know, putting things on shelves. But if that's what you have, put things in boxes. We like boxes. Boxes are good. Boxers with folders are even better because you can label them. Um, but we want to make sure boxes are of appropriate size. You can see here I've got a piece that's kind of folded over. Ideally, you'd want a box that fits that. I bring my own personal collections because I don't always do what I say. Um, but these are also just photocopies of military records, so they're not quite as crucial. <laughs> um, but boxes are great. You can also get boxes for books. So if you have scrapbooks, you can get boxes that are flat that the scrapbook can sit in so that 
you know, things don't just come out randomly at you as they do in many of my mother's scrapbooks where she used rubber cement and you open it up and things just fly out at you because the rubber cement's all dried up now. So, you know, we want to think about these things, but we also want to think about the types of materials that we're working with. So, for example, here we have paper with iron gall ink. It's pretty stable, apart from the fact that some things nibble on it and it's you know, been wet. But as a piece, as it is now, it's fairly stable. I have a drawing here by, I can never keep it straight, but a second cousin once removed, um, who was an illustrator for Disney, and he would do his own Christmas cards, and so my grandmother would get Christmas cards. And you can see here that it's mostly black and white, but then he did a, a color wash. And we need to be careful with things that have color, because if, you know, they're beautiful, we want to display them, but we also want to make sure that we're um, not displaying them with a lot of light. Um, adhesives, of course, if we're thinking about creating our own scrapbooks, Creative Memories has done a lot to raise awareness on using acid-free, lignin-free buffer paper and not using rubber cement. Um, and definitely not using uh, those photo albums that we you know have the little um, plastic page with the you know the, the magic stick, you know the wonder things. Um, after a while, it sticks and it doesn't come off without a lot of um, work. If you do have photographs that are stuck in an album like this and you can't get them out, unwax gentle floss. Just floss them out, works great. But you do, um, we want to be thinking about how we're storing our things to make sure that they are going to be available for our children, our grandchildren, and their children um, down the line. When we think about storage for our digital files, we want to be thinking about what sorts of file formats we're saving in. Um, you know, for years, you know, Microsoft Word has been our, you know, word processing system. How many of us have, you know, documents in Microsoft Word? And most of us are of an age that, um, did you ever go back to try to open an older file and might, that you created in Microsoft Word and it was more than two versions ago and so Microsoft Word wouldn't actually open it? That was a big problem for years. Um, if you have anything important that you want to save for the future, the best thing you can do is to print that Word, pro that Word document out as a PDF. And even better if you've got the capability, PDF A. Um, PDF is a, uh, what they call, a, um, oh dear, the word will come to me. Um, it's a much more stable format, but it's also non-proprietary. So it doesn't need to have a specific software program to open it. It's sure handy to have Adobe Reader, but it can open in other things. So we want to be thinking about that. Our photographs, if you can, if you have the um, capabilities, and you're using a, you know, a digital camera, save them as TIFFs. That's an uncompressed file format. Um, if you have to, you can save as JPEGs, but I would save as, a, as high of a resolution JPEG as you can, so with as minimal compression as you can get. Because when you get a JPEG and it starts to compress that file, what it's doing is it's actually tossing out bits of information to make it smaller. So it would be as if you were taking, you know, that feather pillow that's just a little bit too big, and you just reach in and you grab handfuls of feathers and throw them away, they're gone. You can't get the pillow back up again because those feathers have now flown. So um, think about that when you're creating your digital photographs. If nothing else, save your camera raw files um, because that will have all of the information and you can create the JPEGs to print and share and whatnot. And just um, how many of us, because I've set it up here, um, take pretty much all our pictures on this now? Is this where your pictures all live or do you actually move them 
We'll get to that in a bit. So these are the sorts of things we want to be thinking about with our um, collections. Temperature, relative humidity, again, where you're comfortable, your collections will be comfortable. Light, um, we want to try to keep it low, especially for things that have color. So um, don't hang things uh, you know, immediately across from a big west-facing window because they'll just get light coming in. I highly recommend converting to LED light bulbs um, because they may be light, but they at least don't have the ultraviolet radiation, which is um, very harmful. And like I like to tell my students um, in class at Simmons, we can put on sunscreen to protect ourselves from the UV rays of the sun, but we can't do the same thing with our collections. So we need to protect them from light. Pollutants, you know, we want to just be thinking about dust and where you live. Um, I'm in a rather rural area, so we don't exactly get a lot of um, pollution from cars and exhaust, but we get a lot of dust because you know, it could be different on the flip side if you're in town here, you know, and there's a lot of traffic, you'll be getting an entirely different set of pollutants. Um, but pollutants can also come to us if we're storing things in containers or materials that are not stable. So, um, I don't have one here. The old, um, or the three ring notebooks that you can get that a lot of us put photo pages in and then put our photos in. The outer covering of those is polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, and it um, off-gasses a lot of hazardous chemicals to your collection, one of the prime ones being chlorine, which reacts with the relative humidity in the air to create very microscopic um, molecules of hydrochloric acid, which just really helps to deteriorate things rather quickly. Um, pests, okay, we've got um, this scrapbook, which doesn't have anything in it anymore, but um, did have things in it which, strangely enough, all kind of match this pattern of holes. Um, these are, this was the result of larvae of um, different types of dermestid beetles. And the beetles laid their eggs, the larvae came out, and they said, ooh, tasty stuff, we're going to eat it. And, um, you know, this is what happens. Most of us won't find we have that sort of problem in our homes. You will if you um, store things in maybe a basement or a barn. But what we do find that we have problems with, and um, one of the big ones that we have in our home collections is silverfish. Silverfish will be in the basement, and they will eat your paper, your leather, your, they'll eat just about anything. So, um, we need to be thinking about our pests, okay, and beyond the squirrels, it's getting to be that time of year, for those of you in a little bit more rural setting, the mice are coming in, the moles are coming in, the voles are coming in. I haven't caught a vole yet this year, but mice and moles. Um, actually, I just had one this morning when I went to check my basement. So we need to think about making sure that things are up off of floors, um, on shelves, away from walls, because that's going to be where these rodent pests and insect pests generally like to travel, and it's going to just add a buffer to our collections. Um, in terms of our digital collections, any of us still have some of these? Yeah. Any of us actually have something that plays it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember you from class. You actually knew everything. Most of us are more familiar with maybe having our collections on a CD. Um, it could be on, uh, depending on you know, what your family was like, this is a little um, mini digital video tape. Came out of a, you know, one of the various and sundry camcorders. Um, thumb drives, oh, I didn't leave my thumb drive. And again, you know, how many of us have stuff stored on these? Okay, um, mine, I've taken everything off of at the moment because it has decided that at any given moment, it'll have 80% you know, battery life and it'll just say, oh, no, battery's dead, I'm turning off now. So I don't trust it anymore. 
But one of the problems that we get into if we're not paying attention to our digital collections is we start to run into having things like these with nothing to play them on. It goes obsolete very quickly. And actually, how many of us, how many of you um, have the Apple, um, what is it, the Airbook? When Apple came out with their Airbook, they stopped putting in CD drives. So, these are on their way out. So, luckily for us, we're getting into um, really reasonable rates for cloud storage. Just make sure whenever you're picking a cloud storage um, company that you read the terms of service. I know most of us just go, oh yeah, fine, sign it and ignore it, but read the terms of service. Because a lot of people have um, gotten into the position where the cloud service has shut down and they have not been given access to their, to their stuff. It just shut off and went away. Um, or, you know, of course, it um, could run into the same problem that uh, Amazon had and uh, just lost a whole bunch of stuff by accident. Oops. So, one of the things when you're thinking about your digital collections is to store your stuff on multiple media in multiple locations. This is where, especially for your family collections, <coughs> burn things to CD, put them up on um, you know, a cloud server, put them up onto Ancestry.com and share them with as many people in your family as you can because uh, the more people that have them in distributed places across the country, the safer your collections are going to be. It doesn't help to have all of you in the same house and have the house burned down and have all of your copies go up with it. So, one of the most difficult things that any of us encounter when we're going through family collections. I had this when I went through my father's side of the family. I had the same problem when I went through my mother's side of the family. I am trying to help my mother do it now with all of the stuff that she has. It's what do you save? We can't save everything. Kinetic State Archives can't save everything that could conceivably come to you. The library can't save everything that could come to it. The museum can't save everything that comes to it, especially in Connecticut, because there's only so much room for spinning wheels. <laughs> I did a statewide disaster program with Conservation Connection and went into, I think, about 70 different institutions across the state of Connecticut, and I saw more spinning wheels in that program than I have, could ever have imagined existing. Most of them up in attics, <laughs> because where else do spinning wheels go? But what do you want to say? What is important to you? And this goes for both your physical collections and your digital collections. Almost more for your digital collections, because one of the things that, it, it took me a little while to get my mind wrapped around it, but when I got my first digital camera, all of a sudden I realized I didn't have to be selective in what I actually shot. I could just take pictures, lots and lots of pictures, because I didn't have to limit myself to 36, take the roll of film out, put a new roll in, load it up. I could just take pictures. Well, that's all well and good, but now, where you would go on vacation and maybe take four or five reels of 36 you know, shots on a roll, now all of a sudden I come home from a vacation with 400, 500 pictures. Are all of them good? No. Are all of them actually relevant? No, not really, because especially when I converted to taking pictures with my smartphone, it turned out that um, I take an awful lot of pictures of my feet, the inside of my pocket. It, it just happens. Um, I think, the, and the camera sometimes just turns itself on like it just did. I didn't. So, like I said, my phone. 
It will also um, phantom call people, so. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen when it once again phantom calls Gregor. Drink is random. Um, he seemed to be the biggest culprit of the phantom phone calls from my phone. <sighs> but we need to be honest with ourselves and really think about what we want to say and what is most important to us. Because how many of us in our family collections have pictures from maybe grandparents, great aunts and uncles that nobody wrote on the back as to who they were and you sit there and you go, I have no clue who these people are. A lot of the pictures I got from my grandmother weren't written on and I would sit and I would go, wow. Yeah, I know they look like they look like a con. They definitely have that con face, but you know, I have no idea who they are. So sometimes use that. Do you actually know who these people are? Um, do you know when it was taken, where it was taken, why it was taken? Um, those are going to definitely be of more value to you because you have the metadata for that image. Okay, and for those of you who, you know, metadata is a scary word, it's just information about that object. So the metadata, for example, this picture here, okay, there is nothing written on the back because my mother had it in a scrapbook with um, <laughs> rubber cement. That's what happens to rubber cement. But she at least wrote 1959 on the front. This is my mother, Judy Schmidt, as she was at the time, in um, Pawnee Rock, Kansas, when she went down for the summer of 1959 to spend the summer with my aunt and uncle, who had just had a baby. So she was um, helping them take care of the baby. So um, I know that, you know, I know the location, I know the date, I know the person. I won't comment on her choice of hat, because she was kind of goofy in it, but um, these are the sorts of things that you want to be able to have in terms of your information about your objects. The um, cat and nine tails that has been digitized and is in the collection. My grandfather told me that story. If I had just opened a box and it had been in there, it would have meant nothing to me. So, you know, this information, these stories, you know, the photographs, the documents, they're, you know, they're all well and good. But, you know, when you have the story of um, Silver Threads Among the Gold is a poem, I guess. And my grandfather wrote out this poem and he carried it with him every day when he was in France for World War I. You know. If you just kind of opened up a, a box and this was sitting in there and you looked at its condition and you, you know, you're like, oh, somebody just, you know, as with some of those scrapbooks we find, somebody just wrote a poem out so they could remember it because they liked it. Big deal. Do I need to keep it? Probably not. It's the stories behind what we have that are important. So making sure we have names and dates and locations and stories are so important. Again, make copies, share them with your family, share the stories with your family. Um, that's what's important. And store in a safe, um, stable environment. I like, you know, bedroom closets at the way back are great places for that. But for your digital copies, make sure you revisit them periodically. Because files do start to degrade over time. And the problem is, is we can see the deterioration on our objects like this. We can see when the bugs have been there and we can stop it. We can't see the bit rot happening in our digital files. And so we need to um, open up our files and documents. We need to refresh them. And if they're in something like Microsoft Word, we need to migrate them. 
migrate them to a different file format, migrate them to, you know, if you're keeping it in Microsoft Word, and, you know, words come out with a new version, migrate it to the newest version. Okay, make sure that you are always revisiting your digital files. One of the things I, another thing I tell my students a lot is that your physical collections are just like a cat. As long as you periodically look at it every once in a while, give it food and clean its litter box, it's fine. You know, it probably, it ignores you just as much as you ignore it. Your digital collections are like a puppy. And that puppy needs attention, it needs attention now, and oh, it needs to be fed, now it wants a walk. Oh, now I have to go outside, now I want to come inside, now I want to go outside, now I want to go inside. Oh, Paul, let's chase him. You need to pay attention to your digital files, or you will lose them. Um, luckily, I do keep things in multiple copies in multiple locations, because I have found some of the digital images that I've had won't open anymore. And so I've been able to refresh them, get them back, and restore them from other copies. But it's really important to be thinking about that. We want to think about how we're handling our collections. We want to handle them with care. Um, we don't have to go the full extent of you know, wearing gloves and having cradles and things like that. But we also don't want to give you know, great great grandfather's diary to the three year old to run around and you know, play around. So we want to give them the respect that they need. You know, if we're handling, you know, film, if we've got photographic film, we want to only really handle it at the edges. Um, you know, our photographs, we don't want to be, you know, like I was doing. You know, we, you know, we want to handle our photographs at the edges, not putting our grubby fingers on the fronts of the photographs, especially our old black and white ones. Because over time, as those black and white photographs start to silver, which they do as a natural aging process, where your fingerprints are will become very silver, and you can start to see little fingerprints in the silver on your photographs. Um, objects, what I like to tell people is whenever you're handling objects that are important to you or to your family, two hands. You know, pick things up with two hands. Don't just kind of manhandle them like you do most of the stuff around your house that you use every day. We want to think about handling our digital objects as well. When we had floppies, it was easy. You knew where to label a floppy. I mean, it was pretty clear because a lot of times they actually gave you the sticker already on the floppy. CDs are not quite as obvious. How many of us either put stickers on or just take the Sharpie and write on our CD? The problem is, is that any of that, if you write on this portion of your CD, will over time damage this um, metallic layer, which is where your information is etched. And once that metallic layer starts to go kind of funny, or the um, plastic here, the polycarbonate, gets scratched or starts to go, um, you'll see sometimes a lot of, they'll go milky. Um, when you see that happening, the laser can't read it, and all of a sudden it'll go, yeah, no, I'm not going to read it. And please, please, don't put a post-it note on your CD. I've lost most of the other stuff that just kept flaking off, but um, don't put a post-it note on your CD. I have had more people tell me, but post-it notes really aren't that sticky. I've had this same problem on brittle paper in special collections materials. I've had many a researcher come up to me sheepishly and hand me back a, a book that has been torn because they put a post-it note in and didn't listen. So, yeah, no post-it notes. Great for photocopy paper. Not good for your collections. So when you do need to label any sort of CD, even though they are going kind of you know, out, out the way of the dodo, label them on this inside donut of clear plastic. That way none of the solvents are going to come through. You're not going to do any damage to the metallic layer. Um, and these stickers, although they might look benign, do leach and off-gas. I actually saw... Um, 
at one institution, they had put stickers onto paper folders that their uh, microfiche was in, and you pulled the microfiche out, and there was a perfect mirror of the sticker of damage in the microfiche. So stickers aren't always the best thing. Um, take care of your hard drives. Okay. Um, be sure to get any information off when they start to act funny. My computer at home is doing the same thing as my phone, so it's like I'm deaf to technology, but that's why I keep everything in the cloud. Um, and again, try not to, you know, sticky fingers on your optical media. Um, and definitely don't go sticky fingers on your, for those of you who remember, sticky fingers on your uh, magnetic media either. That goes for any of your VHS tapes or anything like that, too. It's the same magnetic media. Just uh, has a different application. So, does anybody have any questions? You all have a, a handy handout of some helpful hints and some online resources. For those of you who um, really want to know more about the uh, digital, the Library of Congress has a really good personal digital archiving page. Um, they've got information, they've got leaflets, they've got videos. Um, they actually have a really good video. Um, it's only about nine or 10 minutes long on scanning your own documents. So if you want to scan all of your family's documents, they have a great little um, video on the personal digital archiving website that will take you through all of the steps for doing that. But does anybody have any, you know, burning questions about their own own materials? And we'll take them from Facebook too. Do we have any way of knowing? Okay. <laughs> yeah. When you're um, going to convert um, mini, D, you know, mini D, uh, uh, video things like this, um, the regular size VHS tapes, you really want, to, if they are very important to you, you want to um, really look for somebody that has experience in <laughs> working with um, libraries and archives. Your um, run-of-the-mill, oh, we'll convert all of your wedding videos to CD or things like that, aren't necessarily experienced enough to know what to do when they encounter a problem. So for many of our um, audio tapes, whether they're reel-to-reel -reel audio, cassette tapes, VHS tapes, there was a period around 1975 to 1985 that they reformulated um, the binder that held the magnetic media on the carrier. And it is um, really susceptible to hydrolysis. It's a problem that in, you know, professionally we call binder hydrolysis. Um, in general, we call it sticky shed syndrome. So if you have any sort of magnetic media that has that problem, it needs special treatment in order to be able to get that information off safely um, and to be able to convert it from the high-pitched squeal that will come out of it when you try to play it or have everything fall off as they're trying to play it if they're not paying attention. Yes, sir. Do you have any secrets or your favorite method to bring out the faintest writing to bring it out so we can see what's actually going on? Yes. Um, it's going to depend on the type of writing you have. Um, a lot of times if you scan it in, you can really bring it up by playing with the contrast on your computer. But if you have um, something that's really old and it was written with iron gall ink, you can, um, for very little money on Amazon, you can get little um, UV flashlights and ultraviolet light is going to um, react with the iron gall ink and make it, even if you can hardly see it on a page, under ultraviolet life, it is light, it's going to look velvety black. So uh, then that's just part of the nature of iron gall ink. So if it's an iron, really old iron gall ink document, um, try UV light, 
if um, if it's something that was, say, a felt tip that went through a flood, I would try scanning it and playing with the, the um, contrast and the color balance and things like that. Sometimes just playing with those sliders can really help a lot. The ultraviolet's not going to work with the graphite. Um, for pencil, you might really have a problem. Um, because even if you try the contrast, there's usually not enough contrast to start with. Yeah, pencil's tricky. Um, what I would recommend doing is, you know, depending on how heavy-handed the writer was, um, if you get, you know, here just maybe a regular flashlight would help. And if, come on, wake up, there we go, now you've turned off. There we go. So take a regular flashlight, and if you, instead of looking at something like this with your flashlight, if you go at, to the side and set up what we call breaking light, you would, um, if they were heavy-handed using a you know hard um, pencil, which doesn't usually come up very well, and that might help. It's also a great way to. Um, see just how damaged some of your items might be if you go in the raking light. If you have paintings and stuff, you'll really be able to see if there's a lot of cupping. But any other questions? Yeah. I actually, um, you should, most of our phones, it, with their chargers, um, if you unplug the USB end from the charger. Um, you can just stick it into your computer and you can actually download directly to your computer from your phone. Uh, each phone has a different, you know, Android is different from, you know, Google phones, from iPhones, from, you know, so, but you can directly download using your power, your charger to your computer. Any other questions? You were, excuse me, you were mentioning like you know, photo albums where our grandparents wouldn't use rubber cement. What's the best way to deal with that? I mean, if you get it off the page, you still got residue. Well, most of the time it's already dried up and... So it's okay? It's, it's already done its damage. You know, so for example, you know, my mother's photograph with the, you know, rubber cement, there's, it's not sticky. Um, and that staining is pretty much there. You could theoretically spend a lot of time and a lot of money having somebody slowly and painstakingly removing that with some pretty harsh chemicals. But um, for most of us, <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but this picture of my mother is not worth spending, you know, thousands of dollars to have the staining removed. I actually just scanned it in and said, yeah, now I won't lose the photograph if the staining comes through. I also scanned it for the sole purpose of being able to recover the color on the photograph. So that's another thing that your um, scanner is really great for, is being able to bring back, bring up color from faded color photographs. Um, because if you have color photographs, whether they are true traditional photographs or you've just printed them out on your inkjet printer, they will fade. That is just the nature of color photographs. So um, my mother's dress is much more vibrant in pink and red and um, yellow than it is in this picture. Very bright for my mother. She wore much brighter clothes when she was young. So one of the other things I just want to point out to you that because many of us have them, um, are the old photographs on the hard board. Um, they do, over time, as you can see, want to start to curl. And that's just years of changing relative humidity reacting with the board 
reacting with the photograph and reacting with the adhesive that holds the photograph to the board. And so um, what will end up happening is people go, oh, well, I, you know, I need to put this into a, you know, an album or I want to frame it. So it's just a board. All I have to do is put, a, you know, have really heavy weight on it, right? Yeah, no, um, when I worked at the Northeast Document Conservation Center, I can't tell you how many decapitated people came through because somebody tried to do that and the board snapped. So um, sometimes we just have to live with the imperfections because trying to do something about it can cause more damage than leaving it as it is will do. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, I think we're close to time. Oh, we're over time now. <laughs> All right, thank you so much um, for joining me. I'm happy to stay if you have any other questions that you didn't want to ask in front of the group or if you want to see some of the crazy things I have up here. Um, but thanks for joining me, and anytime, you know, in a, a couple of days, a week, a month, a year, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to answer questions.